Good evening. Good evening. And welcome. It's great to see you all here. Uh, my name is Anthony Spira and I'm the director of MK Gallery. Um, it is really disappointing that we're not all in the gallery's beautiful Sky Room Auditorium, but at least I don't have to tell you where the fire exits are. <laughs> um, and I think we're all pretty well versed in remote conversations by now, so I hope this all goes smoothly. We are recording the event and we'll probably upload it online and screen it in the gallery in the future for those who aren't able to access the event now. Uh, in terms of format, MK Gallery trustee Fidel Mutwarasibo and I will be your hosts and each speaker will introduce themselves before they speak. Once everyone has spoken, we'll go around asking individual questions. If you in the audience would like to ask a question, please open the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and post your question. Uh, we'll do our best to address it if we have time. Uh, finally, I should say that we have had one change of speaker. Unfortunately, Carol Baum is no longer able to join us, but I am delighted that Fiona Boundy, creative and cultural manager for MK Council is able to be here. So this evening's event is called How to Improve Inclusion, Diversity and Belonging in Milton Keynes. Obviously it's a massive and extremely complex subject, but we're hoping that this will be the first of a number of related conversations. One of MK Gallery's guiding ambitions is to reflect and represent the communities that surround us and to be genuinely inclusive, accessible and welcoming to all. We work with lots of partners, groups and constituents to improve the gallery's reach. And we're delighted and very grateful that the Community Foundation have just awarded us a major multi-year grant to extend the work we do with neurodiverse members of our community. The gallery does have a diversity and equality policy and action plan, which we will update and publish by the end of the year. But I thought it might be interesting to share some statistics with you from our current exhibition, MK Calling. It includes 130 artists, many of whom are local, and all of whom were selected through an open call process. 54% identified as women, with 4% preferring not to declare gender. 13% are black and minority ethnic, but disappointingly only 1% black British. A further 3% self-identified as mixed race, but 21% preferred not to say. And 11% indicated a disability, with 42% preferring not to say. So this is incredibly useful information in helping us to identify what we need to improve most urgently. But it's also striking how many people are reluctant to declare an identity. So I think this is also something that we need to explore. Tonight's conversation is focused on racial and ethnic issues. We suggested that speakers may want to identify key areas of concern, whether related to health, policing, education, hate crimes, employment, or representations in the media, for example. And of course, that's a big ask for a short amount of time, but we're especially keen to hear about changes that tonight's speakers would like to see happen. As we all know, it's been a hugely traumatic year. With COVID generally, of course, but also the way it disproportionately affects people from black and minority ethnic communities. The murder of George Floyd has also caused shockwaves across the globe and propelled the Black Lives Matter movement into the spotlight. And we mustn't forget the recent Windrush scandal in the UK amongst many other events. The dumping of the statue of Edward Colston who built his fortune through the slave trade in the River Avon in Bristol is totally unforgettable. It was a powerful symbolic act that has accelerated a huge amount of reflection. And the stories of exploitation and pillaging behind many of our institutions, including the contents of our museum collections, urgently need to be recognized and taught. So you might assume closer to home that a new town like Milton Keynes would be disconnected from this histories. But I only recently learned that Campbell Park, the wonderful city park, which our beautiful auditorium looks out over, is connected to the legacy of slavery. Jock Campbell, after whom the park is named, was a visionary social reformer, but his family made their fortune in British Guyana, first off the back of slavery and then cheap labour. After the abolition of slavery in 1833, the British government decided to compensate slave owners for their loss of property. So the Campbell family were awarded the equivalent of 13 million pounds in today's money 
by the British state for over 2,000 slaves. As a complete coincidence, MK Gallery will soon be presenting a major exhibition by a brilliant artist who was born in Guyana, and we hope this will provide an opportunity to explore this story in more depth. And the, imper the importance of learning these histories and to be aware of how our societies have developed is of course essential. Black History Month itself is controversial. 20 years on, it shouldn't still be necessary. But with the Women and Equalities Minister declaring just this week that teaching white privilege in schools is illegal, we're reminded how pressing it is to think about the invisible barriers that surround us and that perpetuate inequality. Some of the uh, events we've organized here at the gallery, which focus on issues related to diversity, such as a conference last year on belonging and unbelonging in the English countryside, has not been as well attended as we would have liked. So again, we're aware of how much work we need to do in order to improve our reach. We do recognize the need, our need to celebrate the achievements of minorities. And I hope some of you are enjoying our current film program which includes, for example, John Acomfra's Stuart Hall project, as well as important and award-winning films by black female directors, Chinonye Chukwu and Channing Godfrey Peoples, whose Miss, Miss Juneteenth film we are screening tomorrow. Uh, thank you very much again for being here with us. I hope you enjoy the evening and I'd now like to hand over to Fidel. Thank you, Anthony. Um, I don't know where to start uh, and follow up to such an excellent presentation. I would like to welcome the panelists as well as the audience uh, on behalf of uh, MK Gallery Trustees. I joined the Board of Trustees very recently. I am not an artist and I know nothing about art, but the reason I did it was to seek a new challenge because I felt in a way, I've been campaigning, talking a lot about diversity, but I needed to go into a new forum. And the new forum was art, and I felt maybe art could help us to send the message across in a subtle way, in a more different way from the ways I've been using in the past in terms of campaigning, advocacy, conferencing, and so forth. So I'm delighted you are all here. In terms of a short introduction because we'll be asking our panelists to introduce themselves. My name is Fidel Mutwara Sibo. I am originally from a place called Rwanda in East Central Africa. I am new to MK. I'm only here six years, uh, having lived in Dublin Ireland for 19 years. Uh, and I was just thinking as uh, we were preparing for this event. So, you know, what does black history mean to me? Uh, and I was a little bit perplexed and I thought maybe I can't ask people to talk without saying what I think myself or how I feel. So what comes to mind as far as I'm concerned are things like colonialism, uh, slave trade, which was mentioned. I would also add something very recent, which is neo-colonialism because uh, Africa may not be colonized, uh, but it may still be part of uh, uh, suffering from neo-colonialism. On top of that, we know there is uh, a lot happening in terms of migration, as well as uh, modern day slavery, which we talk about all the time uh, when there are some scandals. And I'm thinking more in terms of the plight of people who are trying to come in from Africa trying to come in through and producer, Italy and so forth. So there are still a few things which we need to think and uh, inquire about. I am also interested in equality, diversity and uh, inclusivity, but more importantly, I'm interested in the whole area of equity because being equal does not necessarily imply having equity. And I'm very sure the panelists will be reflecting on that. And it was an irony that this month of October marks also uh, the death of two people who are, who are my uh, sort of uh, uh, role models when I was young, when I was growing up in Africa. Uh, one of these is a guy called Thomas Sankara, who was president of Burkina Faso, 
who was actually killed in a military coup on uh, October 15th in 1987. Uh, he may have taken power by force, but he was a good leader. And unfortunately, he was taken from us too soon. I think he would have written the history uh, about Africa and her people. I am also thinking of a guy called uh, Samora Machel, who used to be president of Mozambique, who was killed tragically in a plane crash in South Africa in, uh, in 1986 in October. I mean, the list can go on and on and on and on. So we have had our heroes, we have had our villains, but in actual fact, we need to celebrate the people who have made a difference and encourage others to follow their footsteps and raise up and highlight the fact that, uh, uh, you know, Africa can smile because uh, we have seen so many stereotypes and images of people who are trying to raise money sometimes depicting some images of, of Africa, which are difficult for us to take, even those of us born in Africa and who grew up in Africa. So what am I hoping to get from this event? And then I will finish. I am hoping that you give us some ideas and insights as to how MK Gallery can contribute to this important debate about belonging, about who belongs, who is here, I'm hoping you can tell us how we can engage with those communities even more than ever before, because the st statistics which uh, Anthony shared are a call to action. So we can't rest and say we are done, but we need to do more. And also to think about how you can use our museum, because it's not our gallery, it's not mine, it is also yours, to promote diversity, to promote equality, but more importantly, to raise awareness about the plight of people who happen to be different from uh, uh, the majority population. And obviously bearing in mind that we have intersectionality. So even people who look the same don't have necessarily the same experiences. So what I'm calling for is, you know, helping us to use the gallery to help us to remind everyone that we are all different and we should be treated as such and we should give each other a chance. Whether I do it through art, through films, through music, whatever form of art we use. Please join us on a journey and uh, your ideas and insights are very, very warmly welcomed. I think I'll stop here because we have great panelists who will be telling us a little bit more and inspiring us. Over to you back, Anthony. Thank you very much, Fidel. We'll go straight over to Sas, I think now. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, um, Fidel and Anthony. Can you nod if you can hear me? Ah, fantastic. <laughs> um, okay, so my name is Sas, Sas Amwa. Um, I've lived in Milton Keynes since, oh, probably 88, five years old, but I'm originally from Ghana. Um, I have been working at UOU for 14 years, and for the last 10, 11 years, I've been co-chair of the BME network there. Um, so a lot of the work we do tends to focus on celebrating topical anniversaries, supporting staff with career development, but most importantly, um, addressing issues of systemic racism and advising on race and race policy. Um, so... So the, the question was the question, how to improve inclusion and diversity in Milton Keynes? I suppose um, specifically on the topic of um, ethnic minorities, there probably isn't a need to improve diversity. I think we're probably heading on the right track. Milton Keynes seems to be becoming quite diverse, um, which is kind of delightful. Um, but I suppose on the, on the question of inclusion, what can we do? And I suppose in a way, I've always felt that simply drawing attention to the fact that we're diverse will be a real help in making us an inclusive town and city. There's a lot of, I think, capital, um, cultural capital and credibility amongst the idea of being a diverse, dynamic um, town and city. And when people think of Milton Keynes, the associations that are made of us aren't about this kind of young town, which is really diverse, really multicultural, even though we are. So it'd be really interesting to consider 
I don't know if it would be a promotional campaign. I don't know if it would be an ad, 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 um, a set of ad, adverts, but really drawing attention to the fact that we are this really young, really diverse, really dynamic town. Um, and I think starting to create that kind of perception of us to the outside world will definitely kind of um, engage the general public and probably increase our level of diversity and hopefully pull a lot of the kind of people we want to come to Milton Keynes to come to, come to our town. Um, and the second thing I was thinking of, and I suppose this is in part my fault, um, as someone who's worked at the Open University, and I remember before I worked at the Open University, I had no idea what it was. It was this kind of thing that existed somewhere in Milton Keynes, and you kind of hear about it, and you kind of, you, you know, it exists somewhere, but you've got no idea what it's really about. And then now I kind of work at the OU, it feels like I'm on this island, and we've got no connection to Milton Keynes. Um, and it'd be really good, I think, to just really start strengthening those bonds between huge organizations like the Open University um, and, and Milton Keynes, really kind of creating that community. Um, we've got a huge amount of um, research and work. We, we, so, so for this Black History Month, we put out a call to action only in August and um, to all the, the faculty saying, please engage with Black History Month. And we were overwhelmed by the submissions, um, the research that was going on, the amount of work that was going on the topic of um, um, diversity inclusion, particularly um, from an Afro-Caribbean background. I was astonished to think that how much work our academics had done and no one knew about it. So it'd be really good actually looking forward if we could like, if we've got um, topical anniversaries and events um, that kind of support our diverse culture um, to maybe encourage our academics to not have all this great content that only 10, 15 of us watch at the, at the Open University, but really kind of create strong connections with maybe the gallery and other organizations so we can really share all this great research that we've got going on within the organization and really start promoting kind of what a multicultural um, town and city we are. So um, I, that's probably not quite three minutes, but those are the couple of ideas that jumped to my mind. Um, and I think um, Fiona is next after me. Hi there. Oh, I thought I was third. So that's very good. You said that. Thank you. <laughs> There's me not, not reading things properly. Um, hi, my name is Fiona Bandy. I'm the Creative and Cultural Manager at Milton Keynes Council. Thanks so much for, for inviting me this evening. I actually wanted to start from a, with a quote um, from a strategy, our strategy, the Creative and Cultural Strategy, which reads, um, culture is the way we see ourselves and our place in the world. It's how we live our lives, how we appreciate and understand the lives of others, and by trans try harnessing the transformational power of culture in all its forms, we will help to address the city's current and future challenges. By sharing our cultural capital throughout the city, we will connect and engage our communities. Young and old, building confidence, encouraging cohesion, improving health and well-being, and empowering them to take the lead. As an open city built on migration, with one of the fastest growing and most diverse populations in the UK, we will work towards a city that's really truly inclusive and one whose cultural offer reflects and embraces our diversity. Now that is a vision and it's something that we really, really, really want to work towards delivering. But I think one of the key things that sort of, sort of on the other sort of flip side of the vision are the challenges and by no means are these comprehensive but sort of looking at the work that we do and the work of our sector we really identified that the sort of following challenges are the ones that we want to work towards addressing first and foremost. So originally Milton Keynes was known for its open welcoming hands. I think the gallery's gates are a beautiful uh, sort of ever, a beautiful pictorial evocation of those, those opening hands, the very sort of famous city symbol. Um, but increasingly, we are struggling to offer opportunities for social integration and cultural opportunity. The city's current cultural offer does not represent or reflect the diversity of our communities. Our current cultural audiences don't reflect the diversity of our communities. The cultural workforce at every level does not reflect the diversity of our communities. So those were a set of challenges combined with our vision and in 2018, we wrote a discussion paper. Now you all might think, good Lord, you know, it's very local authority, we'll write a strategy and we'll write a paper. But what we wanted to do with the discussion paper was really create an opportunity to take a hard look at how our arts and heritage sector engage with the communities of the city that, you know, where they actually live. So we commissioned the Arts and Heritage Alliance Milton Keynes to propose a programme of research. And this was a very, very in-depth 
very hard look at our sector. It involved a, a two year programme of work. And in very, very recently, we published the findings of, of that process. Um, it's called Rethinking Cultural Inclusion and Diversity, a call to action for Milton Keynes, which has currently been published, but launches officially on the 16th of November at an event you're all very, very welcome to join. And I think, you know, it sets without, within this report, it sets out comprehensive, comprehensive findings from a very sort of in-depth process. And I think one of the key and most important elements of that work was all the discussions with our focus groups. And I think the findings from those focus groups absolutely combined to create a really, really powerful cause, call for action, a cause you know, to, to absolutely make that change. Reading through the summary findings, again and again you see regular sort of ideas themes and, and challenges that are brought out and i just wanted to read and swiftly pull out a few quotes from those focus groups a person needs to feel that there is something offered for them something to say come here you often go to something by word of mouth i want to see different faces if someone from my community is going i would go but i don't think i'd go by myself I would feel quite alienated and I wasn't welcome. And again and again, when you read through, and it's, there's, a, there's a lot of words, but this, this absolute need to feel welcome and that the place that cultural spaces are open and available to people. But I think one of the things, obviously we have the report and all the findings there are, are really, really important to us. But alongside that, there's a series of recommendations and we absolutely will work with our partners and stakeholders over the next five years to, to deliver them. The first one that we're going to deliver is a cultural apprenticeship and training programme where six young people from Milton Keynes from diverse, diverse backgrounds will be given the opportunity to um, take part in a bespoke training programme that will really give them the skills and the opportunities to engage with the cultural sector and hopefully then go on to employment. Now this is just a drop in the ocean, there's, there's so much that needs to be done, but I think for me the focus on young people, local young people and giving them the entry point to the sector was a really good place to start and if we get it right and we can secure the resources we will build on that work and really look forward to working with you to deliver this. I mean that's one I only one there are many and again I urge you come along to our event on the 16th learn more and and hopefully we can work to deliver what is a, a really inspiring and, and fantastic set of ideas thank you Good evening, um, I'm Dr. Amina Reset Des. I'm a lecturer in politics at De Montfort University in Leicester, but I'm a very proud um, resident of Milton Keynes. Um, I specialize in the study of Islamophobia, particularly the ways in which it impacts women, but I'm also particularly interested in ways in which we can counter Islamophobia. Um, just a couple of weeks ago, my book was published and it looks at Muslim women's political participation in France and Belgium. So that gives you a taste of what I'm interested in. Um, the basis of what I'm going to talk about, I need to define what is Islamophobia. Um, I would describe it uh, much like the British APPG on British Muslims, that it's a form of racism that racializes Muslims. It perceives them as one homogenous group. And as such, anything related to Muslims or perceived Muslimness is often othered or excluded from, from mainstream society. And whilst I work with decoloniality quite heavily in my academic career, um, today I particularly wanted to speak to the power of the arts, both as a tool for inclusion, but also the extent to which um, arts might be used as an anti-racist tool. And in creating anti-racist work, it, this is directly creating belonging and inclusion, promoting diversity within our city. Uh, and more broadly, I'm currently engaged in research to this effect. So I'm currently examining and investigating Muslim centered and Muslim led festivals as a means of countering Islamophobia. The research is entitled Creatively Countering Islamophobia Through the Use of Festivals in the City. And the rationale for this work stems from pan-European work that I've previously been engaged in that looked at best practices at countering Islamophobia. And um, many experts often cited that arts were a way of engaging on an emotive level with the wider society, but also placing Muslims and Muslimness within society. Um, I've specifically looked at festivals in the UK. It's something that I plan to scale up and look more broadly at. Um, and whilst there's the, the sort of dominant narrative around Islamophobia that sees Muslims as other, and in particular as being at odds with Western society, and that, that includes arts, um, being at odds with arts and culture, 
And the reality that I found in the research so far, which is ongoing, is that this is so incredibly far from the truth. Um, Muslim-led and Muslim-centered festivals in the UK are as diverse as Muslims themselves, and they employ arts-based me arts methods, ranging from a literature festival in Bradford, film and photography at the Manchester MacFest, or uh, the MKIC, which is the Milton Keynes Islamic Arts and Culture Association, which uses things such as uh, examining more traditional art forms and music. Um, the, in, the organizers of these festivals that I spoke with often cited the need to counter Islamophobia as being among their principal motivations for organizing such festivals. And their evidence shows that these festivals do work to counter dominant narratives and dominant perceptions around Muslimness. So what for MK? MK is home to uh, just shy of 10,000 Muslims who in and themselves are incredibly diverse. We as a city are incredibly arts rich and culture rich but we are no stranger to Islamophobic hate crimes and Islamophobic narratives, regrettably. MK Gallery and via collaboration with existing organizations in Milton Keynes has the potential to champion such art, art that exists to create a sense of inclusion and belonging for these diverse communities within Milton Keynes. And arguably this can be scaled up across the country. And I would say against a growing background of hate as evidenced in political discourse and everyday society, it is time for those engaged in an anti-racist struggle and those concerned with creating a meaningfully socially just society to step forward and to begin to challenge the narratives that are at play, but also to promote and celebrate our diversity and, and importantly, this can take on diverse means and it can play to our own strength. So in my own case, I look at research as an anti-racist tool, but also it could be through political engagement, through legal work. And I think for the case of MK Gallery and those of us here this evening, we can do this through the use of art. So thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. My name is Martha George. And I've been in Milton Keynes for nearly 35 years. And um, I enjoy living in Milton Keynes. I must admit, I hated it in the beginning, <laughs> but I've grown to love it. <laughs> Milton Keynes has encouraged me to love it, yes. Now we talk about um, diversity and inclusion in Milton Keynes, but Milton Keynes has been running for four years, the Festival of Nations. Last year, we didn't have, we didn't celebrate the festival because the Arts Council was moving to its new area in Kiln Farm. And this year, because of COVID, we didn't keep the Festival of Nations. But the Festival of Nations is always hosted by um, John from the Arts Central, and I'm key um, in helping him to organize the Festival of Nations. So we get um, people as far away as from South Hall coming over to perform as a fest. It's a whole day event where we get people from various backgrounds um, keeping the Festival of Nations in Milton Keynes. So. We are the same as um, going to the Glastonbury Festival, Milton Keynes, we do the Festival of Nations. So we're hoping that, um, in fact, um, yesterday I was thinking I should have asked John to have a, um, a virtual Festival of Nations, since we can keep one, um, a public one. Yeah, so I shall discuss that with him and, um, it would be good if he were to um, have a chat with MK Gallery or some of them was on the, especially um, people who are keen on getting together. So we have a big festival of nations and we have it virtual instead of, um, yes. Now for a number of years, myself and um, Isabel Fraser, we held um, various diversity groups at um, the small um, community centers on each estate. But I've been trying for many years to try and get a, a center in the city of Milton Keynes, a community center 
for other people of Milton Keynes. Instead of having one on each, it's all right to have a small community center on your estate, but you need a community center for the people. So people from every part of Milton Keynes can come together. And I suggested it very early when they thought of doing something with the point to donate it to the people of Milton Keynes for a small um, fee and allow the people of Milton Keynes to build it up. You have to give people things to do. If you don't give people things to do, they, they're lackluster. I remember a few years ago when I said this, about six years ago when I was speaking to our MP, Mark, and I said to him, Mark, the health of the people is the wealth of the state. Not realizing we were having COVID to prove mm -hmm. that it's the health of the people. It's the people as the wealth of the state. We chase after money, but who makes the money? It's the people. So you've got to empower people, give them something to do. So if we can have a center, a community center, in that center we have um, space for the young, the middle, people of all ages and all group, but we need to have it central. And I think where the point is, is ideal for that because you only got to say to someone, it's at the point and everybody know where to find the point. You, from the shopping center, you get to the point. Meetings are kept at there and people of all ages uh, come together and meet. And I think that's one of the best way to get people together. Because if you keep people in their little estates, you keep them divided. Because if you have a central point, everyone will say, oh, I'm going to the community center. And the people, various groups, they will become motivated, try to raise funds and maintain the building. Because among the people, you'll have carpenters, masons, electricians, and they maintain the building. Instead of spending money out of getting other people, the people of themselves will maintain the building. But what we need is a center, a community center for the people of Milton Keynes, instead of little, you can have your small ones, but also you need that main center to bring people together. I think that's one of the best way for cohesion. You have indoor games, like darts, whatever it is. And um, yes, you, people will learn computing. You, you pick up talents from various people by bringing them together. The youth will meet with the aged, the aged meet with the infants and um, people coming together, you will be surprised at what um, the outcome will be. Mm. Yeah. And the BME network set up in Milton Keynes, I was instrumental in setting up the BME network in Milton Keynes. And um, unfortunately, I couldn't, um, once it was set up and I was satisfied it was going, um, I had to withdraw from, from because I was involved in too many, too many things. And um, my health was beginning to take a toll. So uh, I'm pleased that the BME network is still um, on track. But the um, Festival of Nations is something that um, we ought to be engaged with. So I could have a word with John from the Art Central, and then we'll see how we can have a virtual um, Festival of Nations. Show the world what we can do. We are special. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Um, so, um, so my name is Ros. I am a youth worker at Milton Keynes Council, and I've been a qualified youth worker for 19 years. And um, practically all of that time has been in Milton Keynes. And, um, and I just wanted to kind of give you a flavour of what I do and how it 
um, is around helping to improve diversity and why we need to improve the, uh, the inclusion um, in Milton Keynes. So, um, as I said, I'm a youth worker and um, my role is around citizenship and democracy. And um, that's really mostly now centered around the Milton Keynes Youth Cabinet, which I will explain for those who don't know um, later on. But to give you a bit more flavor about who I am, I moved from the North, from, um, from the North in South Yorkshire uh, when I was about seven or eight years old. And um, it was those early experiences of racism that made me question my ethnic identity. Um, because of that, because of the racism I saw, um, experienced, um, my family experienced, I think that's made me who I am today. It's made me um, want to advocate, it's made me want to question um, and teach it more inclusion and diversity um, on, a, on a wide spectrum. Um, but in terms of answering this question, in terms of how do we improve Milton Keynes um, in this area, I go back to my, my profession, um, education. Um, An education for, for me as a youth worker is identified by both informal education and uh, formal education. So looking at primary school and secondary school in the main, because that is the age group that I have worked in, predominantly it's um that those those um establishments lay the foundation for um for knowledge and understanding without that there's nothing to build on and so when we're looking at knowledge and and understanding we need to include race and religion and belonging in that um schools my students that i work the young people that i work with tell me that there needs to be more than just the transatlantic slave trade. There needs to be more than just one lesson about Judaism or um, Christianity um, or any, any religion. It needs to, that knowledge and understanding needs to run through as a golden thread throughout the school so that it encompasses um, understanding, it encompasses um, a bringing together a belonging to all people in that community. And I'm not just talking about the students, I'm talking about the teachers, I'm talking about the cleaners, I'm talking about um, the, the, the parents that come into that school. Everybody has a part to play in, um, in improving that community. And so, but in, in terms of my field as a youth worker, and as I mentioned, um, informal education, my job um, is about citizenship, it's about democracy, it's about bringing people together. And I do that through running student, getting the young people to organize and run conferences and campaigns and, in, and involving them in conversation. So over the years, um, and ex a couple of examples that we've done, uh, we made uh, a film about slave trade, modern day slavery, um, and what happened around the transatlantic slave trade. Um, and we went and explored, we went to museums, we went to the Cooper and Newton Museum, we looked at Amazing Grace and rewrote it and young people were singing it. Um, and, and we made bags like children in India would do for, to raise money for their families. We experience, and it's about the, that informal education that young people um, need to really understand and to, to get under, under that level of just learning something from a, a lesson's point of view. Another piece of work that we did was um, a piece of work looking at Mandela and, and his influence and we had young people creating artwork that was displayed um, um, that, that was displayed in a, in a school for a little while around Black History Month and we never managed to get it anywhere else. That work um, that was created was amazing, it, that whole process of learning and that that's the sort of thing that youth, youth work and informal education tries to do. But Milton Keynes Youth Cabinet, specifically, most recently, a group of eighteen, um, a group of eleven to eighteen-year-olds, diverse in their in their their being as well, um, want change. They strive for change, and I support them to do that. So over lockdown, 
questioning what was going on um, about George Floyd, the Black Lives Matter movement, they wanted to understand. They wanted to question and explore what was going on. So I put together 16 workshops for them that, that looked at racism, it looked at anti-racism, it looked at the Black Lives Matter um, issues. So alongside that, they also took time to write a letter that went out to head teachers asking schools to change, to not just change the lessons, but to change their policies, to change the way they teach, to look at the curriculum and make it a lot more homogenous in terms of, of, of it encompass that issue, the issues of inclusion encompassed around the whole life of, of schools. Um, and we've had a couple of schools come back and we were really lucky that the, the uh, BBC Look East actually last week put out a, a piece about that letter. Um, and the young people feel really proud that they have tried to, to make a change and are seeing change from it. But they, they want more than just that. Um, so re reflecting on all of this though, I think that there are three, three areas that we need to do um, in Milton Keynes. We need to embrace our fear, um, the fear of the unknown, the fear of feeling silly, the, the fear of not understanding and not sweep it under the carpet and say, oh, well, it's okay, it doesn't matter. We need to, we need to embrace it. We need to um, persevere. And when we don't have uh, meet our targets for who's coming through the doors or how many people are taking part in this, that or the other, we need to, to not just stop and go, well, it doesn't really matter. We need to persevere and go, well, let's do it again, but we're gonna look at it and do, do it differently. And then we need to also encourage those who don't take part look at what are the personal barriers why aren't they taking part in these things and you know Milton Keynes at the at, when it first was created was had community workers they had community workers that worked out and met people as they they came to their new home they embraced them they brought people and communities together and we need to do that we need to bring those people together and break down those barriers and the cheesy part of my 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 last thing of, of three words um we need to listen, we need to listen, and decision makers, people in power need to listen too. We need to learn from each other and no one is too big or too high powered to learn. And we need to effectively love each, uh, learn to love each other and embrace, the, our, um, embrace that and, and understand that we all have feelings and that we all bleed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Indeed, Ros. Sorry to interrupt, Hannah, but just to say thank you very much. We've, we've received one question so far, but please do keep the questions rolling in if you go down to the bottom of your screen and click on the Q&A and we'll try and address some of your points uh, in a moment. Hannah, over to you. Hello, everyone. My name is Hannah Olariwaju. I'm a creative and I work in the music industry. I work for a major, major record label. Um, that's what I do. But I also have a hand in a lot of different projects surrounding music and the surrounding creativity as well, based in London and based in Milton Keynes. I've worked with the Milton Keynes Gallery to put, well, I founded the music room, but I worked with the Milton Keynes Gallery to put it on. Or oh, I haven't since COVID started, of course, but, you know, <laughs> just reminiscing. And um, yeah, I'm a creative who likes to put on creative events for those who live in the local community. So the question is how to improve diversity, inclusion and belonging in MK. And like the rest of the people on this panel, which have been amazing so far, um, I have a lot to say, but to condense that all in like three to five minutes, you know, I'm going to try my hardest. So bear with me. <laughs> I think one of the main things we need to do is to change the attitude of the people that live in MK. My demographic, my as part of the young people in MK, um, there is this attitude that there isn't a lot going on, that there is no, there's no real creative elements to Milton Keynes. And like, almost like there isn't a black brand, there isn't a culture associated with Milton Keynes that you'll be, be able to go outside and tell other people like, oh, have you been to MK to do so-and-so? We don't really have that yet. I'm saying yet. <laughs> But yeah, I feel like the main thing we need to do is to change our attitude, especially towards the excluded creatives on the outskirts and find active ways of engagement and involvement. That's what, that's the kind of like the foundation of my idea. We need to be active in involving other people that are not on the forefront of the creative scene in MK to come forward um, 
and be creative. And we need practical and deliberate steps in order to do this. And um, I, I like to use myself as an example. As someone who moved to Milton Keynes from London, um, it was a very big culture shock. First thing is that shops were closing at like 10 o'clock. I didn't really understand what was going on coming from a 24 hour city. Um, but another thing that really kind of opened my eyes was just the help that we didn't have the same resources. I came from a, I came from a community where there were so many activities to go to, especially as a, as a child, to then come here as a teenager and not really find a lot of things to do unless you create it yourself. So I guess that did empower me in secondary school, I was the music person. I sang, I put on, I formed a music group with a friend of mine and we did a lot of those things. But when it came to leaving secondary school, there wasn't a lot of guidance in where to go creatively. There was a lot of where to go academically. So I followed the route of going to university and you know pursuing that passion and becoming more academic and somehow found myself in IT. Um, but after that, after two years in IT, I literally quit my job because it wasn't for me. And a year later, I found myself back in music and I work in the music industry now and I'm not leaving it. <laughs> so um, talking about this stuff and kind of working in theory is very important because it sets a good foundation and it's a very good first step. But in order to lower the risk of it just becoming a tick box exercise, something that we just do because we have to do, I feel like we need to make sure our strategies and our steps forward are intentional. And I use the word intentional because that obviously means to do things with intent, but it also means to do things with meaning. And to be, in order to answer this question of how to improve, we need to first understand why we need to improve it. What is the end, what is the end goal? What are we trying to get to? So what I've come up with is a series of whys as well. And one of them is to enrich the quality of lives of the people living in MK. We've seen the effects of merging cultures together and how that enriches a community, how that makes just life a lot better, fills a life with color, right? So that's one of the reasons why we want to improve inclusion and diversity in Milton Keynes. Another thing is that it firstly establishes, but also improves the relations that we have amongst different groups. If um, many different groups, many different um, ethnicities and cultures are throwing events left, right and center, are doing a lot of active things in the community. It just, you know, it, it entices us, the rest of us to wanna go and engage and be involved as well, because we see that they're being active. So that's another reason why we need to improve. And another one is that it provides um, awareness and access which is so important because you can't attend things if you don't know they're going on. You can't be involved in things if you don't know they're going on. So that's another reason why we need to improve diversity, inclusion and belonging in Milton Keynes. So then how do we do this? I mean, this is now us stepping into the practical element of what we need to do in order to achieve those great things that I've just mentioned. And as a promoter, as I mentioned before, I ran, I worked with the Milton Keynes Gallery to establish a brand called The Music Room. And through The Music Room, I put on um, music events, live music events for local and established artists, just for them to have a place to perform. And one of the, probably the most compliment I received whilst doing that was that they had never had access to a place to perform before in Milton Keynes, especially one that suited their community. And I just mean this in the urban space, well, you know, black and other minority ethnics, um, but it was very inclusive to the white community as well. We all just kind of shared this um, understanding and belonging that we just wanted to perform. We just wanted to be around live music and we just wanted to socialize in that space. So the music room really helped to kind of build this culture um, amongst the young musicians and other music lovers in Milton Keynes that they finally had a space and they finally had a home. And I really hope that we'll be able to continue that after, you know, everything calms down. <laughs> so um, one of my biggest challenges and struggles first starting out was finding a space and finding a consist and consistent earth. Uh, and finding a consistent space. Because what I wanted to do was I wanted it to turn into something bigger than who I was and for it to grow, do you know what I mean? Um, but it was one of my main struggles. So finding Milton Keynes Gallery and firstly establishing a relationship with Simon and then with Nikki and then the, the wider group, um, it was an amazing opportunity for me, one that I really cherished because it kind of boosted me up to establish and find my potential in myself as a promoter and also bring everybody else that wanted to perform along with me. So 
this is kind of the basis of what I believe is a key objective. And this kind of ties into what Martha also said before, we need access to spaces to be creative. If Milton Keynes Gallery didn't give me that opportunity, no, the music room would not be here. They trusted me, I hope, <laughs> but mainly gave me the support to just do what I needed to do to enrich my community. So I'm almost pleading with venues and establishments alike to open up their spaces and engage with local grassroots creators and innovators, people that actually have the desire to put on events in different, you know, different uh, in different arts, different creatives, doesn't just have to be music. But, you know, another thing that I, I hear, especially amongst us that are the innovators, the ones that are behind the scenes, is that we just don't have enough spaces to put things on. We don't have access to the spaces to put on. We don't have the resources to put on the events that we want to put on. And that's a huge barrier, because what that's actually doing is pushing us out of Milton Keynes to go and put on events in other places that have that accommodation and have that venues. However, I know that there are potential for that to happen in my local community. I live five minutes, 10 minutes away from Milton Keynes Gallery. I live right in the central. And there's so many spots that I identify every day to be able to utilize that I feel like we're not utilizing. So that's that the basic, um, the basis of my idea. I feel like we need to kind of have an accountability with those kind of venues to you know, actively go out into the community and encourage people to come and use their venues, especially when it's not really being utilized to the full effect that I feel like it can be. And, you know, engage creatives to use their spaces. Because then in doing this, we have open discussions and dialogues with all the different types of people in MK. So we can see what we're really made of. Doors that are closed do not get utilized. And we need to be able to utilize every single venue, every single space in order to truly show the creativity and culture that Milton Keynes has. Thank you. Hello, um, I'm Bonnie Adili and I organize a Black Lives Matter protest in Milton Keynes. Um, I'm so glad that Roz, you went before me because like I completely agree with everything that you said in terms of like, I so believe that education is the key to like getting us out of this like massive social rut that we found ourselves in. And I am, um, the strange thing about when you organize a march, people then start referring to you as an activist. And I am completely led by heart when it comes to these things. And my heart at the moment, um, when I first got the email from Anthony, I was thinking, I actually don't know exactly what I want to say because I put on the march because like my heart hurt like that's that's the reason why and, and when we needed an, an outlet for that frustration and for that hurt that like all I could think about was the fact that I've lived in Milton Keynes since Christmas Eve 2008 and unfortunately that's where a lot of my um, a lot of issues to do with identity and otherness started to creep in going to secondary school um in Milton Keynes and that is because of children will be children and teenagers will be teenagers but also because of teachers. And I understand that teachers are not paid enough and they are very, 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 very busy. And there's that's a very difficult sector to work in. But at the same time, I feel like what needs to happen at the moment in this like driving forward, trying to add stuff to the curriculum, making sure that um, the what students are being taught is a much bigger variety than what they're being taught now. I think it's also very important to have compulsory unconscious bias for teachers. Because what happens is if you are a teacher and you are teaching something that's wide and varied while still holding a lot of unconscious bias, that's not going to be massively helpful to the students because you're then gonna filter whatever's behind there and your unconscious into the work that you're teaching. And I think that, that can be extremely dangerous. I remember being um, in English classes and reading Of Mice and Men and feeling like, like I was a complete alien because my teacher was constantly saying the N-word, obviously, because that's in the text. Um, and we were learning about how women were being treated in, that, in the context of that time and how black people were being treated. But I didn't feel safe in that. There wasn't education in that. I just felt othered. I just felt like my teacher saying the N-word, my students, the, my colleagues and peers are looking at me. Um, I, I now feel uncomfortable. And because I feel away, me voicing the fact that I feel a little uncomfortable, I'm then dismissed by my teacher because he doesn't understand how that feels to be a black woman in a room and to have somebody using the N-word and not knowing exactly where your power sits 
like the power that you have as a 15 year old, which is essentially nothing when you're in a classroom with, with a teacher, that I was then dismissed by my teacher because he didn't understand that his unconscious bias filters through the way that he, he taught me and didn't take me into consideration at all. So I think like that is something that, that is so desperately needed is unconscious bias for teachers because my, my father is a teacher and he's one of the good ones. And I know what a massive difference he makes into, he's made into the students that he taught in um, Milton Keynes life. People still stop him now in Asda's and Tesco's like, oh my God, thank you for this and this and this. So I know how important a job it is. And I think although teaching is such a hard job that ego needs to be put to the side because then we can start the process of actually unlearning because the unlearning is, is what makes like the teaching of diversity like worth it <laughs> there's no point filtering new things through um uh what am i trying to say there's no point trying to teach new things and um culturally important things that mean a lot to people if you haven't worked on yourself and i think that should be provided like by your institution not just you having to unlearn as a person which is what that you should do but the institution should provide courses for teachers to um unlearn their unconscious bias and not just across race across gender and classes and because we've seen the classes in this country just just from yesterday and how little um a lot of people in in like our, our two mps voted to let children starve today so like we know that there's issues um in within milton Keynes. and aside from that i'm also an actor um and i at the moment i'm in the process of trying to create like mini groups so I, I think that you do everything uh, better through arts and through like expression as, as, I, as I'm hearing that everybody else is as well, which is incredible, um, that I'm trying to come into contact with the Deputy High Commission of Barbados who wanted to do like history lessons. And we're trying to do that and add some acting in there so that like we can take children from the ages of seven to 11 of Milton Keynes and create like essentially mini drama clubs, which are also like, um, conjoined with historic learning about more than just the transatlantic slave trade and like your actual history and like how important where you come from is and the contributions that your country, which they don't teach you in school, the contributions that your country has made um, to, to not just Britain in the, in the world world, but also like your cultural significance in the place that you come from. So yeah, that's me. Thank you very much. Bonnie, thank you very much. That was brilliant. Um, my name is Camille Yafai, and I am the CEO and diversity and inclusion strategist at Diversity Marketplace. I'm also the author of Demystifying Diversity and Yemen Proud, which is my own sort of um, you know, ancestry and heritage. Um, I've lived in Milton Keynes for 20 years and I've seen, you know, not as many changes as those that have been before me. However, you know, a lot of people have talked about the diversity of Milton Keynes. Well, here's a, here's a few stats for you. In 1991, we had 6% ethnicity. In 2001, it doubled, more than doubled to 13%. In 2011, it doubled again to 26%. And in 2021, just based on half in the growth that we had before, it's potentially 35%. So Milton Keynes is diverse, but is it inclusive? And I think that's a question that a lot of people are asking at the moment. One thing that we do know is to be inclusive, organizations, need to change. They need to adapt and they do that through conversations with the people who those changes impact on. And, and to be honest with you, I'm quite pleased to say that, you know, some of that work has been done and is being done and there's more work being done. I mean, from my experience, I'm also a, a trustee at the Parks Trust and a trustee at Women Leaders UK, and I'm part of the steering group for Milton Keynes BAME Business Network, which I'll tell you a little bit more about 
in a moment. However, the, there is some great work and has been some great work going on to look at inclusion within Milton Keynes. And I say in my role within the, the Parks Trust and some brilliant people at Parks Trust, four years ago, we developed a strategy to, to focus on increasing the audiences from diverse backgrounds. And you will have seen over the last four years that there's been some phenomenal uh, events happening like Africa Day, um, you know, Africa Diaspora Day, India Day, and many, many others. We've had West Indies cricket matches. You know, there have been a host of other events. Also the numbers of barbecues and family events um, organized for individuals from different minority backgrounds, you know, um, as well as ambassadors. You know, if we want to engage with communities, the best way to engage with communities is through those communities. And some of the work that the, the Parks Trust have been doing over um, the last few years is building up networks of ambassadors so that those ambassadors who are from the diverse communities of MK are spreading information, whether it's around sort of, um, you know, accessing funding or accessing various parts of the parks, the lakes and all of the green spaces, but also around jobs and other opportunities. That's one of the, the you know, the good things that's happening in terms of engagement. Also, Fiona touched on earlier about the, the new strategy and action plan, which will bring together and, and almost bridge the gaps between where communities are and where the arts and culture sector is. But a lot of that work has been, as Fiona mentioned, through the engagement with communities. And all of this is about how we engage and how we encourage individuals from the various minority communities. And sadly, we, we are still a minority. Although if, if we do come in at the census at 35%, we won't be much of a minority. Um, there are other things happening. I mean, there's recognition within Milton Keynes that black, Asian and minority ethnic businesses have been have not been supported in a way that they they should be. And last night, last night we launched the MK uh, BAME Business Network um, with around, you know, uh, let's see, eight uh, members of the steering group, and we had 40 businesses attend. And these are businesses that want to grow, want to develop, want to tap into other businesses within MK. You know, also individuals that, you know, have huge amounts of talent. And we talked about, you know, if I talk about cognitive diversity, and that's the diversity of thinking, creativity, and innovation that all of our diverse communities have, but we really haven't been able to express those in a meaningful way now through, through various initiatives, particularly the, the business network, you know, there's going to be opportunities to support new businesses from black, Asian and minority ethnic backgrounds. You know, individuals that want to start up their businesses, there'll be events um, around funding and, you know, an upsizing of businesses. So there's going to be a huge opportunity why were these necessary? Why was the network necessary? Um, partially to, to level the playing field so that we could grow with other networks and integrate with other networks, but also showcase the talent that exists in MK. And there is huge amounts of talent. One of the other things that it's really important. I mean, I, I love the, you know, uh, the music room and everything that Hannah was saying about, you know, the work that she's doing and the fact that, you know, it's encouraging others to actually engage that may not have been engaged before. And Hannah is a great role model, you know, and there are great role, role models in the room, you know, but one thing that we have to do is we have to be the change agents 
We know that this needs to be driven. We have so much knowledge between us. How do we become change agents and how do we drive you know, the changes that need to be made? So we have a brilliant opportunity. Milton Keynes is still growing and it's growing in terms of diversity hugely. Let's make the most of, of that diversity. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, what an incredible series of moving, inspiring and thought provoking contributions. Um, thank you very, very much indeed. Um, we don't have a huge amount of time, um, so I'm not going to ask everybody uh, a question. I might just ask a couple of questions and thank you to the audience for, for, for putting your comments and questions through. Some of, some of them I think we'll get back to you directly outside of, uh, outside of this meeting, but I did have, um, you know, a couple of questions I'd like to ask and Fidel if you'd like to come in and make some um, observations and ask some questions yourself of course please do so but maybe I can just start with a question for SAS actually maybe uh, because you are, were one of the shortest contributions um, on the evening but I also wanted to ask because you've clearly got such a um, huge experience and I think you said you'd been on the inclusion team at the OU for 10 years so would you be able to say briefly what the change is um, are in, in, in your role in, or in what you've observed? What, what, what changes have happened over those 10 years and, and maybe even what changes haven't happened that you're most frustrated about? Um, so I can say for maybe the first six, seven years of my role, very little change happened. I think we started to see a bit of change when we applied for the Race Equality Charter. And um, so for those of you who aren't aware, um, um, Advanced HE offers um, higher education institutions the opportunity to do a kind of internal audit on the experiences of staff and students in relation to um, race and ethnicity. And um, the Open University probably, as you all know, is um, a, a fairly well-known kind of left-leaning institution um, and it projects um, a particular image and I think for the most part when it comes to certain groups they might not be off, far off the bat, but um, the results for the Race Equality Charter were quite damning. Um, in terms of the um, degree awarding gap for BAME students and the experiences of staff, particularly from BAME backgrounds. And I think for many members of staff, it wasn't a particular surprise, um, but for many members of senior management, I think it was a really difficult um, pill to swallow. Um, they're really struggling to reconcile the perception of the Open University in terms of the image it projects to the outside world and the reality of the experiences of staff and students. So I think that was about two or three years ago. So at that point, I think that the, the, um, we started to see a bit more change happening. Um, and I think this summer, following um, everything that happened, there was a real push to um, go push for change. And in the 10 years I've been doing it, I haven't seen as much change happen as I've seen in the last four months. Um, so we have um, hired a new EDI Dean of Equality, um, Professor Marcia Wilson, and she's one of the only black female um, acad professors in um, England, which is on the one hand tragic, but on the other hand, it's great that we have her and she'll be moving to Milton Keynes as well. Um, and we've started a bit of work now on, we've just actioned the decolonizing the curriculum working group, which is kind of really positive. And we're putting together our terms of references. And we've realized that one of the key reasons as it's been pointed out by Hannah and um, Bonnie um, in, in the, the curriculum in, in the Open University is incredibly Eurocentric and incredibly male. Um, and there's a huge amount of work going down and to start to understand then how do we start presenting um, curriculum from the global south and why do we um, value particular knowledges from certain um, um, from the, um, European cultures as opposed to um, African cultures, Arabic maths. Why? So there's a huge amount of work going down to kind of unpicking the curriculum and there's a lot of work now going to like teaching um, um, teachers um, how to engage with the curriculum and um, we've had a few problems on common rooms recently particularly with we have associate lecturers who aren't central academic staff and um, whenever topics of Black Lives Matter came on the forum and um, whenever topics um, about kind of post-coloniality and decolonizing and um, the curriculum came on the forum there was a lot of pushback and there was a lot of language used which was, wasn't appropriate and to say um, to say it was borderline racist would be an understatement and 
I think it's been a huge wake up call to a lot of senior managers at the Open University. Um, the forums now have been, there's been an in, uh, internal review of the forums. Um, a lot of people kind of have been removed. Um, they accept now that actually the status quo wasn't good enough. Um, so I'm in the process of um, helping to review training, which will go um, to all members of staff. We're completely reviewing the concept of training as well. It's not enough to just identify an unconscious bias, but what is the larger strategy once you've identified them, someone that has a prejudice, how do you work with them? How do you show them to change? Um, how does that become part of a larger strategy which changes the culture at the Oak University? Um, so yeah, to kind of um, to, to, to round off my, my meandering waffle, um, for the vast majority of the time, there wasn't a significant amount being done, but I think, um, if we can draw some positive aspects from the social justice movements in the summer, there's a huge amount of work now being done. We're just hoping it can be done in a kind of coherent, structured way, um, so we don't miss the boat and kind of miss the target. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Sas. Again, all very, um, very interesting. Um, a, a question, Roz, um, for you. I, I'm really pleased we haven't talked much about COVID um, this evening. Um, which is a bit of a change, but but I wanted to ask you, with all the work that you do with young people, um, maybe I should say our our young we, we've got a group of young people that we work with, and I've heard that um, they refused to do more digital programs with us. What they really wanted was to be, you know, in in the space physically together. And I wanted to ask you, how has COVID um, affected your work with young people in Milton Keynes? Wow, yes. Um, oh, um, so the youth cabinet, um, which would normally have um, about 20 odd active members coming to meetings, went down to about 12 um, at our last meeting. Um, young people don't want to be in front of a screen. Um, and, and I don't want to be in front of a screen as, as a, as a, as a teacher, um, as someone who facilitates learning, I it's all about being active with them. And um, and and I've just finished a session before this came, and uh, most of the time the computer doesn't want to connect, so one of them couldn't even connect. Um, video goes off and on. They can't. I always have my video on so that there is a connection. A lot of the time they don't want their video on, so they'll end up talking over each other and. And, and the core groups, the core num um, who have been coming to the, the, their campaign groups have really been striving to, to get through that. And when they weren't at school and when they, wasn't, they weren't having as much schoolwork, they actually wanted to meet every week. Um, when, and, and we've gone back now to meeting twice a month in terms of the um, action groups, but they are so desperate. And when we we recently met, um, three of them met um, together so that we could take part in a national um, a national event um, for the uh, British Youth Council's um, annual AGM. Um, and they just found that so so powerful for the fact that they could the three of them with myself could come together and hook up to that national meeting. And be together and it actually had a major effect with um, one of the policies that they wanted to put through which actually was about um, um, racism um, and it meant that that policy went through because they were together if they weren't together they wouldn't have been that that policy just wouldn't have gone through um, which generally to most people will, won't really mean anything but to those young people they were like this is exciting we, we're, we're making a change and, and that infection just like, I, this is like Christmas to me. I'm, I'm back in front of your people. Um, and, and they, they want it. And um, the other two groups, the, camp, um, the climate change group sent this, this evening an email to request so that they could plant trees in December um, uh, outside um, that they, they, they've got some, they, they, they're working with a, a local partner. They're going to plant four apple trees in a local estate and some hedging as part of their campaign. We're waiting to find out now whether or not we're going to be able to do that um, and, and physically meet because at the moment we're not allowed to physically meet. None of my colleagues are allowed to physically meet young people unless it's one-to-one. -one. Um, so over COVID, 
every single birthday I have taken a birthday package and I've knocked on their door, sang happy birthday, either made a cake, bought a cake, got given a cake um, to have that interaction because I'm desperate for it. And, and they're, for me, they, they're, they're like an extended part of my family um, and they're all very important for a while they they interact with me. Um, and what they do is just as important as well. So I'm not sure if I asked answered your question, but um, the young people are desperate. They don't want to be in front of a computer screen. Youth workers don't want to be in front, of, in front of a computer screen. And we want to get back to some sort of normality as much as we can. Um, so we're hoping for change. They're hoping for change. Our Feeling Safe group who wrote the letter to head teachers um, want to do um, an event in uh, in January with the MPs, uh, police, um, and that's going to be online, but we need to use the civic officers to do that. So they've written an email that's going to go out on Monday um, and, um, and we'll hopefully be able to, a small group of them, a few of them together, to be able to meet, to, to keep going and keep pushing their campaigns and, and keep making changes. Fantastic. Thank you very much. That was very uh, moving, actually. Um, thank you, Roz. Hannah, um, can I ask you uh, uh, to say a little bit more maybe about the, the music room? And, um, you know, uh, thanks to Simon. I, I think he's listening to us as well. It was, it was great that you uh, worked with him in the beginning and, and um, that you're having conversations with Nikki. But you, it was very inspiring what you were saying about um, needing spaces to, to do things. And the gallery absolutely wants to be like a, a platform for, for people to to um, uh, to perform and, and and test things out and 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 all that, so we're we're very keen for the music room to come back, and 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 to grow. And I I wondered if you um, could say a little bit more about how it evolved, uh, maybe what some of the highlights were for you, and, and if you've got some thoughts about what direction any changes you might like to happen, how it might expand, how we could. Um, uh, yeah, how it could be developed in, in, in the coming months when we're allowed to be together again. Yes, certainly, and I'll try to condense it. I'm just looking at the time. Um, but it essentially started from a place of lack, which I think a lot of businesses and, and stuff like that normally stems from. Um, I started my career in music in 2017, and as a journalist, um, I was very much grassroots, so I had to do a lot of late nights, a lot of you know, just being on the ground, I had to be there. So I was very much at every venue in London, chasing after musicians, trying to get an interview. Um, and that kind of just made me realize that I was traveling, you know, every week, twice a week sometimes to London to watch music and watch live music. And I started to get really frustrated, like why can't I just drive 10 minutes to go and you know, do that as many of my peers in London had the luxury to do. So after really just mulling over it and just start, started to get really tired of traveling, I, um, you know, just come up with this idea, like, you know, if they can do it, I can do it too. And literally started going on this hunt around Milton Keynes for a venue. And the first venue I actually did the music room in was in a bar. I don't think it's here anymore, it's called Missoula. And um, that was the first venue and there was only about seven people in attendance and the seven people were my family and friends. So it was nobody new, <laughs> um, which was, you know, would have been disheartening if it wasn't for the fact that um, I knew that this was needed in MK. I need, I knew that people needed it. And so I just persevered, um, kept on going, just doing a lot of like smaller community halls, doing it in in-house, you know, just really trying to keep it going until finally there was an event that a joint event that I did with a woman called Thara Papula who is um, based in London now but she had an event called um, ooh I forgot what it's called um, ooh Soapbox that's what it was called I don't know if you guys remember Soapbox um, and we did a joint event together for Black History Month I think in 2018 and then that established the relationship I had with the gallery met Simon and then from then we started to just like do one every single month so the music room was started as a venue and environment for local musicians to come and perform simply put and um, we literally grew from seven to 70 like 
every month more and more faces started coming out more and more musicians wanted to get involved and this year 2020 was supposed to take us to the another level we were supposed to start engaging more with established artists and start putting on more intentional direct shows based on what the artists wanted and start to feed in more art more culture just you know to really make the music room a place that people wanted to go to and then unfortunately the thing that we do best which is you know social cohesion and bringing people together was almost outlawed and so we had to take a break um and during that i did try to digitalize tmr um, i call it TMR for short and um, create a podcast that we can have conversations ongoing about creativity in, in Milton Keynes and, and music in Milton Keynes um, but however I was going through my own personal struggles dealing with COVID dealing with other issues that I was going through and creativity really takes a hit when you're going through personal issues and so I kind of just kind of decided you know what everybody else is resting I should also take a rest as well and so so far after having my meetings with Nikki we've just been having many mainly like just introductory, introductory talks about what we want the TMR to look like once we can put it back on. Um, nothing's concrete as of yet, but fingers crossed that soon we'll be able to make more of a concrete decision. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you so much. That's really brilliant. I look forward to, 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 to watching and being part of the next, uh, next stages. Um, unfortunately, we're not, gonna, we're not gonna be able, as I said before, to go um, to talk to everybody again, but um, I wanted Gamil, if you might um, say uh, say something about intersectionality, and then right. Fidel, maybe you would um, come in and, and 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 say a few remarks uh, of your own. Okay, intersectionality is one of the terms that is going round and being circulated at the moment, um, and you could say. Some people get it, some people don't. But the whole concept of intersectionality is, is about seeing the individual and seeing the multiple identities that people have and the different diversity strands and how they interlink and intersect. For example, you know, a woman isn't just a woman. <laughs> you know, she will ha already have an age she will, she may have a religion, but she will have multiple identities and those different identities, you know, impact on her life. You know, you might have a woman who is black. And if you think about inequalities in society, we know that women are sort of, you could say disadvantaged. We've just got to look at the gender pay gap. We know that black women are even more disadvantaged but also black women experience prejudice as well as white women, but different types of prejudice. So what you have is you have an individual who is seen as, or who is being uh, treated unequally by not just one set of people, but by two sets. And if that woman just happens to be black, and has a disability, that's another set of people. And if she has kids, then that's another set of people. So when we look at intersectionality, it's, it's the differences that different people experiences with multiple identities. And, you know, but also the brilliant thing about intersectionality is the fact that all of those different experiences give those individuals added sort of knowledge, added experience, ways of navigating around different systems because of the lived experiences that they have. So when we talk about the diversity of creativity, innovation and thinking, you know, a lot of women who have been disadvantaged because of their intersectionalities and the different identities that they have will have added knowledge of doing things differently, of challenging the status quo, all of those things that society needs and has to have in order to, you know, challenge the difference and challenge the status quo. So quite basically intersectionality is just the different identities that we, well, that we all have, but some people suffer because of it. Thank you very much, Camille. Good 
Thank you, Damil. Uh, it's uh, probably my uh, uh, fault for uh, bringing the issue up, but I was observing what was being said in the chat room. That's the main reason why I felt we needed to address the issue. So thank you very much, Gamil. So in terms of my uh, sort of uh, final remarks before uh, we hand back to Anthony to say thanks and close the session. Uh, one, obviously, as a trustee of MK Gallery, I'm delighted we have had such an interesting and thought-provoking event. So the question is, what do we do next? We have to pause think about all the comments plus all the questions which came through and then think about doing something and making sure that this is a beginning and not an end because it would be very sad if we just stop here and then we are done. It's not good enough. The other thing which I thought I, I, I should raise is uh, uh, I saw a program on television a few months ago and it had an intriguing title which was you can't become what you can't see. So that was a very profound message for me. And it is something which obviously came up when people are talking about the young people, unconscious bias, the curriculum. I think there is a lot of work we need to do to make sure that we all feel part and parcel of institutions like MK Gallery, bearing in mind our inter intersectionality. I think I'll stop here and pass the button on to Anthony to say thanks and uh, close the session. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Fidel, and, and, and thanks everyone for your brilliant contributions. I, I really have a huge amount to, 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 to think about now and, and we'll be in touch very soon because as I've said before, I hope this is the first in a whole series of related conversations. Um, but I did all, also want to say um, that we are aware of what is being called cultural taxation, which is the weight of responsibility put onto people from minority groups mm -hmm. to deliver advice or to act as spokespeople. So I, I would like to express my deep gratitude to all of our speakers tonight for their generosity in agreeing to participate. Thank you very much. And we're especially grateful to Fidel, who we very much look forward to working with to make sure that we improve all of our processes and performances. And I'd like to close the event with a quote chosen by Liz Gifford, who's MK Gallery's chair, who unfortunately couldn't be with us tonight. But it's a quote from an article titled, Are You British Enough? by the writer Nikesh Shukla. And it goes, integration is about us standing together in our individuality, observing what we have in common and how that makes us stronger and what makes us different and how that makes life more delicious. Thank you very much indeed. Enjoy the rest of your evening and hopefully see you all again soon. Thank, Thank you. you.